Houston, performance is nominal. Go for a release. These views are spectacular. <laughs> You like this, Houston? It's firm. Right now, 380 miles above the Earth, a multi-billion dollar eye in the sky is circling our planet in hopes of answering humankind's most fundamental question. Are we alone in the universe? Join me as we go behind closed doors and to the outer reaches of the cosmos with NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. It's about the size of a school bus. On Earth, Hubble weighs more than 12 tons. In orbit, it weighs nothing at all. Hubble has really, I think, revolutionized uh, astronomy uh, in the latter half of the 20th century. Since it was deployed in 1990, we've spent $250 million a year to keep it up in space. In that time, Hubble has traveled nearly 2 billion miles and sent back nearly 500,000 pictures. It is the most productive scientific platform ever in the whole field of, of, of science. Putting a telescope in space gets around the biggest problem with looking at the stars from Earth, the atmosphere. Astronomers say stargazing from land-based telescopes is like bird watching from the bottom of a swimming pool. Our vision is blurred by the atmosphere. Hubble is above all that. Hubble has produced amazing and incredible images. A swarm of ancient suns, colliding galaxies, the glowing remains of a dying star. Truly, it's pioneering new science. And I also like the fact that even if you're not an astronomer, that the beauty of the images and the sense you get of where you are in the universe and what the universe is, is just so profound. When you see that picture, what are you seeing? Boy, that's really cool that we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> and we have got an unbelievable picture from the elbow camera right now. Since only astronauts get to visit the telescope in space, I'm going to do the next best thing. I'll go behind closed doors to meet the people who operate Hubble and download its remarkable images. My first stop is at Goddard Space Flight Center, just outside Washington, D.C. The Space Telescope Program Manager is Preston Birch. If Hubble so much as hiccups, he's going to know about it. Operations room, this is where the flight operation team lives and operates the Hubble. How far up is the Hubble? Hubble's approximately 380 miles up. And how fast is it going around the Earth? 17,000 miles an hour. It's uh, about the same as going from San Francisco to New York in about 10 minutes. Power for the instruments on board Hubble comes from huge solar panels. Go! Critical commands that aim the telescope, control those instruments, and keep it healthy are sent from this mission operations room. GSM running GSM on 37. That's good. All right. Since the Hubble is in constant motion here at the control center, technicians and engineers work in shifts around the clock to keep the telescope focused and functioning. Can you take a look at the high rate switch, please? Pointing the telescope has been compared to taking a picture from a Ferris wheel, one that's going thousands of miles an hour. But Hubble has the technology to do it. Everybody knows that when you hold a camera, you've got to hold a camera real steady. Okay. Hubble is the steadiest of any. If we were standing here in Greenbelt, Maryland. If we were holding a laser pointer in our hand and a friend of mine was in New York City holding a dime, Hubble Space Telescope can hold the camera so steady it could keep that laser pointer on the dime. There's no live image from the Space Telescope. The pictures are downloaded as a series of numbers. That's what I'll be doing. I'll get to talk to the telescope, so to speak. My job is to send a command that tells Hubble to download a new image stored in its memory. Okay. It's kind of like hitting the play button in space. Engineers here call it a data dump. There's like a, a finite time, right, that you can actually retrieve this information. That's You're on right. a countdown right now. Hubble Space Telescope is real busy now. It's taking lots of pictures. If we don't get this data off, then there's not room for the next data to be taken. In fact, this data would be overwritten and lost. 
Even though my task was to simply type a string of letters and numbers, I started to feel the pressure to get it right. Nothing goes to the telescope without someone else looking at it and making sure it's right. And okay, making sure that no one person can make a mistake. Exactly. There's no room for mistakes in a $250 million a year program. You got it. I can appreciate that. My countdown reached zero, and the window to talk to Hubble opened. The telescope only understands its own language, so I typed my commands in Hubble speak. D, S, P, B. All right, we're out of wait. Go to playback. Yeah, you hit the enter. And this enter. will do it. This is it. All right. That just made playback start. Now, we don't know no, it No, it didn't start. We're putting it down to G there. OK, one G. Double G. One G. One G. One G. Now, enter again. Okay. Now we have it. Now we have the data coming down. What looked so simple had just triggered a complex series of events crossing thousands of miles. When I hit enter, it actually took less than a second for the signal to go from my keyboard to White Sands, New Mexico, up to a data relay satellite, and then on to Hubble. Was my data dump a success? We wouldn't find out until the flight controller confirmed the playback. Quality looks good. Okay, Quality so you did it. Quality looks good. You All got right. It. Back to Earth. I took a great picture. I can take. I can't do that on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Days later, when the data was processed, I found out that my picture was a group of stars outside of our own Milky Way galaxy, 50 million year old stars, 168,000 light years away. As humble as it looked, that's just how every spectacular color picture starts out in black and white. Joan, this is something that's never been seen before. This is an image that was taken with the Hubble telescope, and this is a picture of a star that has exploded. But stars and galaxies may not look exactly like the pictures we see. Each color does represent a different type of matter. That's a science. But the way Lisa Frattari interprets those colors is an art. I put together a color image that is something that hopefully is stunning, something that captures the imagination of, of the scientist who says, wow, I, I didn't realize that that was going to look like that. It captures the imagination of the public to say, I didn't realize things looked like that out there. The light from this star took 2,000 years to get here. So even though Hubble just took the picture, what we're looking at is already 2,000 years old. How excited do you get about what you are able to see here? I feel so lucky with my job because you're, you're looking at stuff that's, it's like art. It's like, it's like painting, but yet it's all coming out of scientifically uh, real data. These stunning images have tickled the imagination of stargazers around the world. But the first pictures from Hubble brought nothing but groans of disappointment. When Hubble started out, it didn't work very well. Coming up, the trouble with Hubble. We felt really terrible and embarrassed. How a repair mission in space saved NASA's nearsighted eye in the sky. London continues here on a and &E. The images from the Hubble Space Telescope soar above those from ground-based observatories. Its vantage point above the atmosphere makes Hubble a one-of-a-kind telescope. I think it has surprised everybody how powerful of an instrument it has been. You can't publish a paper in the field of astronomy without using data that's come from the Hubble Space Telescope. NASA began drawing up plans for Hubble in 1972 but astronomers dreamt about putting a telescope in space since the 1920s. The first serious proposal came back in 1946, long before we had a space program. And everybody, I think, from scientists all the way to ordinary folks on the street, were really anticipating this. It was, in a sense, the same as anticipating uh, a person setting foot on the moon for the first time. The telescope was named for Dr. Edwin P. Hubble. An American astronomer, Hubble discovered that our universe is expanding. His insight led to the prevailing scientific theory that everything started in one explosive event, the Big Bang. And liftoff. First scheduled for launch in 1986, the Hubble Space Telescope was put on hold when the space program suffered a tragic blow. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. 
The space shuttle fleet was grounded following the loss of seven astronauts and the shuttle Challenger. NASA had to rebuild and rethink. Meanwhile, Hubble was earthbound in expensive cold storage. Go. In April 1990, after a delay of four years, the space shuttle Discovery took Hubble into orbit. Congratulations on a super mission. Okay, thank you, Steve. It was great fun. There is no question that the Hubble Space Telescope has changed the course of history. But shortly after it was launched, many in the scientific community considered it a $2 billion failure. Ordinary people and scientists were expecting that the first time we pointed Hubble to an object in the sky, miraculously we would see this beautiful clear image unlike anything it had ever seen before. And what actually happened was that we couldn't focus the telescope. We kept trying different techniques and all the images were fuzzy. We felt really terrible, but, and embarrassed, I might say. The trouble with Hubble made it a laughing stock. You kind of didn't want to tell anybody you worked on Hubble because the news was pretty rough on us. You know, if your next door neighbor or someone next to you on an airplane asks, what do you do? I'd say, I sell insurance. And, you know, no, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but I wasn't really eager to say I'm, I'm working with this uh, troubled NASA mission. Psychologists talk about the five stages that you go through when something traumatic happens. You know, first there's denial, there's et cetera. Frustration, I frustrate, anger, anger and acceptance. acceptance. And uh, the one additional thing, though, was that we were determined to fix it. The problem was devastating. Like a pair of glasses with the wrong prescription, the defect was in Hubble's primary mirror. The primary mirror is nearly eight feet in diameter and polished to an extremely smooth surface, but it had the wrong shape, so images appeared fuzzy. The flaw was tiny, about 1 50th the thickness of a piece of paper, but big enough to distort Hubble's vision and shake our trust in NASA. Rather than resign themselves to failure, scientists devised a fix. I think the, the one thing that made Hubble so popular is that it's probably the comeback story of the 20th century. The solution was like putting a contact lens on Hubble's out-of-focus eye. It was named the Corrective Optic Space Telescope Axial Replacement, COSTAR for short. COSTAR would replace one of Hubble's cameras. Small mirrors shaped to correct the flaw would unfold inside Hubble and bounce the light from the primary mirror into the instruments. But before astronauts could install COSTAR on Hubble, they had to come here, the clean room at Goddard Space Flight Facility in Greenbelt, Maryland. This is where astronauts rehearse with the actual equipment that goes up to the telescope, so there will be no surprises in orbit. The smallest speck of dust could ruin the telescope, so this room is 1,000 times cleaner than a hospital operating room. One entire wall, 89 feet tall, is made up of special filters that remove the tiniest particles from the air. Russ Werneth took me behind closed doors and through the ritual everyone must complete to get into the clean room. All right. First thing we do is have to clean our shoes. The scrubbing starts at the bottom. Everyone's shoes go through a cleaner. <laughs> Sticky mats grab bits of dirt off your soles, and then you have to step into the ultimate blow dryer. This is an air shower. It feels a little like being in the hose of a big vacuum. All clean. <laughs> The height of fashion in the clean room is what they call the bunny suit. From the hood to the jumpsuit, booties and mask, nothing is left uncovered. With all this stuff on, I felt more like a doctor headed into surgery than an astronaut going into training. So this is the clean room. Yes, this is uh, actually the largest clean room in the world. The clean room holds what they call high fidelity mock-ups of the telescope. That means they are as close to the real thing as possible. 
So up in space, the astronauts have to go up and open doors like this, just like exactly. we just did? Exactly like we wow. just did. What do they tell you when they come back about what it's like working up in space? Well, perhaps the biggest compliment I get in my job is that they tell me that it looked exactly like they saw it here in this room. Do you ever wish you could be up there yourself doing it? Always. Yes? I'd go in a heartbeat. And we have liftoff. Liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour on an ambitious mission to service the Hubble Space Telescope. Installing the corrective optics would be like doing eye surgery on Hubble. Houston, it's really big. In fact, the scientist who planned the spacewalk was a surgeon before he became an astronaut, Dr. Story Musgrave. Musgrave is known as a no-nonsense perfectionist. Around NASA, they called this veteran spacewalker Dr. Details. In the ways I suppose I was exasperating to be around, but the beauty is in the details. And so my focus was on being the best I could during spacewalks, making every single move to perfection running every mechanism to perfection. Even after months of training, the outcome of the mission to install CoStar and fix Hubble's vision was still in doubt. It was said that the future of NASA itself was on the line. NASA told people we were going to fix it. The media asked me, how is it going to turn out? I said, it's a drama. Wait and see. I said, I don't know how it's going to turn out. Three and a half years after Hubble went into orbit, Musgrave and three other astronauts embarked on the most ambitious spacewalk ever planned. They spent more than 35 hours trying to fix the ailing telescope. Everybody is nervous. We all have a great deal of confidence in the astronauts, but everybody holds his breath. The phone booth sized co-star was gently guided into place. This fix had to work because the mirror itself could not be replaced. Without it, Hubble would be little more than an orbiting testament to failure. As they pulled away from Hubble, no one knew if they had really succeeded. And I thought, maybe all that's not gonna work. We're not home yet. We've got to get pictures back. Until you get pictures back, you're not home. For 10 days, scientists anxiously awaited the first images that would tell them if their mission was a success or not. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> Finally, the champagne flowed as Hubble proved it could meet its full potential as the telescope with the keenest vision. It took some time, uh, and it took a lot of, a lot of good, uh, good brain power going on, and we figured it out. And uh, by gosh, that really felt good. It felt good to overcome our problems. Next, Hubble is without a heartbeat. The patient was dead. Suiting up for Hubble's most dangerous operation. A and E. The dramatic repair mission to fix Hubble's flawed vision was just the first of several high-altitude maintenance calls. The fact is, statistically, Hubble would stop operating after about five or six years if there weren't servicing missions, just because of the uh, failures of things. Hey, man, it's great to see you, old friend. Roger that. Your state vector closure is 1.3. 1,034. They were supposed to have 1 1.5. One. If fixing the mirror was like eye surgery, then the most recent mission to Hubble was heart surgery. To keep Hubble working, it needed a new power control unit. To change that piece of equipment, Hubble had to be turned off. This was a drastic plan, one that was never in the maintenance book. The biggest thing was, you know, what happens if we go to turn on one of the instruments or go to turn on a piece of hardware and it just doesn't come on because we had never done that before. This mission was made even more difficult because more than 30 connections had to be made in a tight space at zero G. Joan, this is a full scale model, very accurate model of the power control unit. This is the actual unit that the astronauts trained with all the time. In the clean room, I experienced the challenge the astronauts faced. 
I'd have to try to complete the connections wearing the same bulky gloves they used in orbit. There's hardly any space back here. The gloves take away your sense of touch, and they're so big it was hard to reach in, hold the connector, and still see what I was doing. It's not an easy job That's because it's so tight and there's so many connections It's there. just incredibly hard. And I mean, I can't imagine doing it weightless. Trying to get to the topmost thing, but there's just not enough space around this large cable here. On the 5th of March 2002, for the first time, Hubble was completely shut down. This is Mission Control Houston. Hubble is without a heartbeat. And also, when you do that, the spacecraft is going to get cold really fast. With the power off, the astronauts worked against the clock. If they took too long, Hubble's systems would never recover from the paralyzing cold of space. In this case, we all held our breaths because uh, for a four-hour period or so, the patient was dead. And after the surgery was finished, we had to bring the patient back to life. The moment of truth came after Hubble's new heart was installed and the power was turned back on. Hubble has a heartbeat four hours and 24 minutes after power was cut to the observatory. I just can't tell you how relieved I was. That was the closest thing to a true nightmare I've had in working on Hubble, that something would go wrong during that change out. While Goddard Space Center handles engineering, the core of Hubble's research science is in Baltimore. I went behind closed doors of the Space Telescope Science Institute, where they manage and archive Hubble's wealth of data. If all of Hubble's data was stored in book format, it would take up 800 miles of shelf space. But everything the telescope has seen in 12 years fits into this room. The Institute keeps Hubble's enormous amount of information on these three computer systems, so it can be accessed worldwide. Thousands of scientists compete for observation time on Hubble. The Science Institute gets about a thousand requests for the use of Hubble each year. Once a year, we put out a call for proposals. Everyone who wants to make observations on Hubble Space Telescope can submit a proposal to do that. You can do it. Your grandmother can do it. Everyone gets an equal shot. It's a public facility. Uh, these folks are here 24-7. A panel of nearly 100 scientists whittles the list down to the most promising requests. In fact, last year, we got more than 10 times as many requests for the telescope time as we could put out. Discoveries made with Hubble have changed the way we look at our universe. Hubble proved the existence of black holes, and because of it, we have a better understanding of the life cycle of stars and galaxies. Just like the car you drive, Hubble will eventually wear out. Its mission is expected to end in the year 2010. Hubble will be replaced by the next generation space telescope, which will be even more powerful. With it, astronomers hope to see to the very edge of our universe. But what will become of Hubble? The scientists that have nurtured it for so many years would like to bring it home. Well, we're going to bring Hubble down. We're going to go up and uh, retrieve it the same way we launched it, using a space shuttle. And then the shuttle will bring it back to Earth, and we'll put it in the Smithsonian in the Air and Space Museum. So what can we find in these images from space? And why do we look to the stars? I think it's the human psyche. We're explorers. What is out there? It, 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 people want to know, are we alone? Is there someone else out there? The probability that there's life is, is really very high. They may be very different creatures than we are, but the one thing we all have in common is that night sky. And I think all of us believe in our hearts that somewhere out there is life, and maybe life that's similar to our own. Hubble gives you an insight into whether that's possible or not. I think that's why it's so intriguing to people.